that you guys are with us this morning. If you are visiting with us or maybe um, you have not filled out a Connect card in a while, we um, encourage you to do so. There's some in front of you, and you can also go on the website and fill out a Connect card on there as well. But we are so excited. Today is going to be a great day, and um, we are so excited for that. We want to let you know that um, C1 Church, that we have started a blog, and so if you are interested in blog reading, and it will just be about um, the the sermon series and things that we're going through. So if you are interested in doing that, you can find it now on our website. Um, this next week, you'll be able to find it on our website. And then um, if you would like to share or subscribe any of our YouTube, Facebook, or we are on Instagram and things like that for any messages or anything that we have to encourage you, please feel free to do so. Right now, we have an amazing video, and we are about to celebrate something that is truly amazing. If you would please turn your eyes to the screen. Hi, my name is Chelsea Doty, and I've been attending C1 for a little over a year. I normally can be found back in the AV booth when I'm not sitting with my friends in service. I got saved when I was 14 years old at my grandparents' church after hearing the pastor talk about a woman at the well and living water offered to her. Shortly after, I gave my life to Christ and was baptized. However, I never fully made that head-to-heart connection and found myself earning my way into heaven. Seven years ago, I went through a pretty dark depression and turned away from God. In 2020, I knew something had to change, but I still lived a double life searching for meaning. That all changed in October of 2021 when my double life caught up with me and through prayer and worship music and the prayers of friends and praying family members and as well as the TV series, The Chosen, I gave my life back to God. And on December 28, 2021, I said yes to him. And I went from living a life that I recognized with the woman at the well to relating to her again and wanting to share what Jesus has done and that I was one way and now I'm another. How amazing is that? Yes, give it up. That is so amazing. And let me tell you, I have noticed a 100% change from the old Chelsea to the new Chelsea. And it is literally amazing to see what God has done in her life. And when she told me that she wanted to be water baptized, I said, yes, that's what we need to do. And so here at C1, we share our story. We celebrate Jesus and we share our story. We live in community. And that's what she did. She's sharing her story and her testimony of what God has done for her. We are living in community together as a church to be able to witness an old life coming into a new life and ready to walk with the Lord and with, with all that Jesus has for her. I am so excited. Chelsea, you are are amazing and God bless you for this next step. He's going to do amazing things for through you. All right. Chelsea, upon your confession of faith, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You can stand with us as we celebrate Jesus through worship. What an awesome thing that is, baptism. So let's just pray this morning, and let's just invite the Holy Spirit here this morning. God, we just love you. We thank you for who you are. Jesus, we thank you that you just purchased our salvation, and you made a way, God, so that we could have access to you. God, we thank you for new life. We thank you for baptism and what it means. God, and we just celebrate you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship him together. And I search the world, and I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures of faith are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is 
is now satisfied to hear your love. Come on, sing it out. Sing, there's nothing. Oh, there's nothing. The God of the mountain is the God of the valley, and there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Let's just give him worship. Well, let's just thank him this morning. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Jesus. Oh, there's nothing better. again you give life you give a life you alone you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken and great It's your breath, it's 
Just give him worship in this moment. To you only, Jesus. You are worthy of our worship. Mm. Come on, just sing out in the spirit. Your bread. 
into your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you. To you, oh caught up in your presence and I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave oh, oh here for blessings and Jesus you don't owe me anything more than anything that you can do I just want you I just want you Jesus sing I'm sorry and I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sing another song. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. God, that you're enough. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I'm caught up in your presence. And I just want this morning just sing this out sing I just want you I just want you nothing else nothing else nothing else will do I just want you nothing else nothing else Nothing else, cause only you satisfy me, and I just want you. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do, and I just want you. Nothing else, nothing else.
And I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy Just to sit at your feet, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Just to hear your heart beat. you glad that God is here to meet you right where you're at? And he's enough. He's enough for every situation. He's enough. He's enough to walk with you through grief. He's enough to walk with you through, through lack. He's enough to walk with you through healing. He's enough. And we don't even have to ask he wants to move in our lives but he doesn't mind us asking he tells us to let's just take a moment and in our own words let's just thank the Lord let's just thank him for what he's done in our life thank him for the blessings maybe you just need to look back at this last week last month, last year and just thank him well, let's thank the Lord for what he's done. Let's just just get, just take a moment. Let's just thank the Lord.
presence of God, there's fullness of joy. There's fullness of peace. Father, I pray right now for peace over every heart and every mind. I pray right now, Lord, that all the, all the thoughts that might be running a million miles an hour on our heads, I, I pray that you will steady us so that we can receive from you, receive from your word today. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray, I pray. Please be seated. Isn't God good? Isn't God good? I'm excited today for a number of reasons. Like, I feel like I I wish I would have taken an, um, oh, what is it, copywritten the word excited? <laughs> I feel like I, I say it enough to where I would be loaded. But... I'm excited today for multiple reasons. Chelsea stepped out in obedience. And you're like, well, you might say, like, why, why do we take and baptize? Um, is that optional? I, I don't believe baptism is required to get to heaven. You can have a relationship with Jesus and not be baptized and go to heaven, i.e., the thief next to Jesus on the cross, right? He did not get baptized. Jesus didn't say, all right, I'm going to postpone my death for a moment. Let's hop off this cross. Let's baptize it. No, he did not do that. But Jesus did command us to be baptized, so it, it is a command. And Chelsea, I'm so proud that you stepped in obedience to that command, and you said, you know what? Jesus already did the work on the inside, but I'm going to declare it to everyone publicly, and it's a public declaration of what God's already done. But I'm also excited for the fact that we have the great and tall and anointed Pastor Ben Herzog bringing the word today and we're in a series called Lessons on the Lake. So let's give it up for Pastor Ben and Jesus at the same time. And he's going to bring the word. Good morning, everybody. How's it going? What an exciting day to be a part of. Whether you are here in person or you're watching online, we want to say welcome. Thank you for being a part of today. Thank you for celebrating with us what God is doing in the life of Chelsea and the life of so many others, and we're just um, humbled to be a part of that. I want to say uh, hello. If we've never had the opportunity to meet, my name is Ben. I'm one of the pastors here at C1, and I have the privilege of being able to serve here, to serve on the staff, and to serve uh, in this community. We're excited about what God is doing in Columbia, Tennessee, and uh, wherever you're watching from or wherever you're coming from today, uh, God doesn't make mistakes, and so thank you for tuning in and for uh, taking time, carving time out on your Sunday to make this a priority. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to be one of Jesus' disciples? To hear, see, and experience Jesus over the course of his ministry here on earth? Over 2,000 years ago. Imagine not just being able to observe and watch from the crowd, but to be in Jesus' inner circle. What it was like to see Jesus stub his toe, get food in his beard, listen to him laugh. And after the crowds were gone, to be face to face with the Son of God, to ask him questions. When you heard things and saw things you didn't understand, and be able to literally go to him and say, Jesus, I, can, you, can you help me understand? I, I, I didn't get it. Or even become accustomed to the sound of his voice regularly. And over the last few weeks, we've been in a series called Lessons on the Lake, and we've We've tried our best to give you an idea of what it would be like to kind of be on that, on the inside scoop, to get the inside scoop and to, to know Jesus intimately and to see him and to hear him teach and do things, especially when the crowds had gone away. We've looked at the teachings and miracles that Jesus reserved only for his disciples in those times that he had with them. And so we've been in a series over the last few weeks, and today we're going to continue in that series. Today, we're going to tell the story of Jesus walking on the water. Now, before we get into our passage of Scripture today, um, our passage is going to follow 
what has been described as Jesus' most popular miracle, and that's the feeding of the 5,000 and 5,000 men. So it could be anywhere from 10 to 20,000 people total that Jesus fed that day. But to give a little bit of context or to give you a little bit of background to speed you up to the story, Jesus and his disciples were trying to step away to a desolate place to mourn the death of their family member and friend, John the Baptist, who had just been beheaded. But Mark's gospel says that many saw where Jesus was headed and went ahead of them by foot and gathered the multitudes so that by the time Jesus and his disciples arrived at this desolate place, multitudes were waiting on him. So just when the disciples and everyone's like, finally we're going to get a break, we're just going to get to step away from all of this and process what in the world just happened, there's multitudes waiting. And Mark says in his gospel that Jesus looked out on the crowds and had compassion on them and he began to teach them. Following this teaching time is when Jesus works what would be argued as one of the most popular miracles that Jesus does feeding 5,000 men and their families with a Lunchable. And this leads us to our passage and where our passage is going to begin today, just to kind of give that background. Now, I want, before we jump in, I, I need you to understand that there's three Gospels that hold this story or that have this story, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and John. And... Uh, we're going to walk through portions of each of these accounts. And the reason is, is because there are things in each of the accounts that the others don't have. And so you're, you didn't ask for this, but you're welcome. You're, we're going to get a, a full, full, full-on, three-dimensional side of this story. We're not just going to hear from one, but we're going to look at the same story from at least three different perspectives this morning. So we're going to be jumping around into the different passages. And for some of you who are like black and white and you need to stick to the script and the one account, I'm sorry, you're going to have to just flex with me a little bit today. But we're going to get through the story. The first gospel that we're going to be jumping in today is in the gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 14. Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 14. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there or your phones. Or it's going to be provided for you on the screen. And it says this. We're going to be reading out of the NLT today. When the people saw him, this is Jesus, do this miraculous sign. It's the feeding of the 5,000. They exclaimed, surely he is the prophet we have been expecting. Everybody say expecting. Moses Back in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 5, talks about that God is going to send a prophet. And so these people, this is what they're thinking. This is, they're thinking this is who this guy is that just fed us with a Lunchable. And a lot of people believe that the, that the multitudes had no idea necessarily that, there had, that this great miracle had taken place. They just all of a sudden knew that they had food, so they were happy about that. And verse 15 continues, When Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. This leads us to our first point today. Is that Jesus is better than what you are expecting. Verse 14 says, Surely he's the prophet we have been expecting. Jesus is better than what you're expecting. He's better than what they were expecting. It's important to understand that the superheroes of this day, kids weren't wearing PJs with Batman, Superman, and Captain America. They were wearing PJs with Moses, and Elijah, and Elisha, and King David, Samson. These are the heroes of this, this culture's uh, story and, and these are the people they looked up to and these are the people that they told those stories of and those are the kind of PJs their kids would have been wearing. It would have been these stories that have been told regularly at bedtime or around the dinner table. The people were looking for a deliverer, a prophet or someone would, that would free them from their oppressor like God had used them to do in the past. But Jesus shows up. 
and evidently in the form of a call. No. But Jesus shows up, and he wasn't quite what they were expecting. And you ever, have you ever been there? When what you were expecting and what you actually got were two different things? When I think about that, I think about, um, man, I don't know how many years ago this was. So, about 16 years ago, we felt uh, that God had put in our heart to move to California, Southern California. And there was a youth pastor um, position or an opportunity to serve at a full-time capacity at a church. And we had been serving in, in our local church for the last four or five years um, working a job so that we could do and be a part of what God was doing there in this church. And uh, in the midst of this, we felt God opening a door and, and kind of giving this opportunity. And so we stepped into this. And when we first heard about, we're going to go to Southern California, man, I'm telling you, the picture that I had in my mind is like, we're going to be sitting on the beach with all these teenagers and surfing and having campfires and all this other stuff and, you know, walking down the boardwalk and just sunshine, and then we arrived in Barstow, and those of you who have never been there before, it's the Mojave Desert, it's where our men and women trained before they went over to Iraq and other side of the world, to what it's like to train and to, to live life and to do war in a desert-like place, that's where our men and women go, is out to Barstow, Barstow, California, at beachfront property. Lots of sand, not so much ocean. So we had this thing in mind, but, but what we got, what we were expecting and what we got were two different things. And Jesus wasn't exactly what these people were expecting. And maybe you're here today and that's you. That Jesus isn't exactly what you were expecting. But lucky for them and lucky for you, Jesus is better than what you're expecting. Jesus knew that these people weren't, think, were, uh, weren't thinking, and, and he knew what they were thinking, and he didn't want them to make him something that he wasn't. They weren't, he wasn't going to allow them to make him something that he wasn't. We started with John's account. Now we're going to continue in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verse 45. And I know we're playing, I'm, I'm jumping around on you a little bit, so I'm going to give you a little bit of time to turn there. Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verse 45. And it says, immediately after this, the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and head across the lake to Bethsaida while he sent them home, the multitudes. After telling everyone goodbye, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Late that night, the disciples were in the boat in the middle of the lake, and Jesus was alone on land. He saw that they were in serious trouble rowing hard and struggling against the wind and the waves. About 3 o'clock in the morning, or what some Bibles call about the fourth watch of the night, which was a time I think that was created by Rome, but nonetheless, about 3 in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. Now we need to stop right there. That's not normal. Some of you that grew up in church, you hear that phrase and you're like, yeah, that's what he does. When's the last time you saw someone walk on water? Never. Jesus came toward them, the disciples, walking on the water. And the next few words are something that I think can get us a little confused. And it says that he intended to go past them. That's weird. So let's just call it out. That's weird. Now, at first glance, you might wonder, why in the world would Jesus go past his disciples that, that we just read in Mark's account that were in serious trouble? That's the words that were used. Why would Jesus go past the disciples that were in serious trouble? And I would submit that that Jesus had no intention to pass them by. And I think that the audience reading Peter's account would remember a story in Exodus chapter 33 that they would have regularly heard. 
Because remember, once again, one of these people's greatest heroes was the, was the man that God raised up to lead them out of a place of slavery, a place called Egypt. His name was Moses. And these stories had been handed down generation after generation. And this is a story that would have been taught at this same mountain that God gives the Ten Commands. That Moses asked God a question. And if you've never read that chapter, right now you just need to like take a mental note or write it on your notes for, from your app on your phone or something. Go read Exodus 33. If you, don't think that, if you think the Bible's boring, you need, to, you need to get into it more. But read Exodus chapter 33. It's an incredibly hilarious, funny, and mind-blowing chapter. Basically, God tells Moses that he's, going to, uh, that he's welcome to go to this land that he's going to give them, but that God's not going to go with them. He's like, if, you, if I go with you, I'm going to kill you along the way. So you just need to, you guys take your happy little rear ends and go march into the promised land that I'm going to give you. And Moses has a, has a response to this. And so I'm going to let you just read the rest of that chapter. But it's, it's an amazing chapter. But in the midst of this, this interaction back and forth between God and Moses, Moses asks for one thing. He asks for a couple of things, but specifically we're going to talk about one thing. Moses asked God to show him his glory. And what's interesting is that God obliged. And God says, Moses, I, I, I can't let you see my face because no man can see me and live. So I'm going to let my goodness pass by you. And I'm going to cover you with my hand in the cleft of a rock. And, and as I'm passed by, key word, passed by, by, two words, I'll cover you and I'll lay up, let my hand off you and you will see me as I'm leaving. You'll see my back, the back of my goodness. And he allowed Moses to see the back of his goodness as he passed by. This is a story that had been told. This is a story they knew and they were very familiar with. And God wasn't passing by Moses to just walk past him. It was a, there was something going on here. And we're continuing in verse 49 of the Gospel of Mark. Verse 49, but when they, the disciples, saw him, Jesus, walking on the water, they cried out in terror, thinking he was a ghost. They were all terrified when they saw him. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage. I am here. Then he climbed into the boat, and the wind stopped. They were totally amazed, for they still didn't understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves. Their hearts were too hard to take it in. The next point I would like to make is that Jesus wants to reveal who he is to you. Just as God wanted to reveal himself to Moses, Jesus had no intention to leave the disciples, but he wanted to reveal himself to them. He could have walked across the lake at any, and gone in any direction, but he wanted to reveal himself to those disciples. Scholars believe, by the way, that, that the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 men, we don't know how many were total there, but that the way that they were seated in groups, that the only people who may have even witnessed the actual multiplication that was going on there of the feeding of the 5,000 would have been the same group of men that dispersed the food, which were the disciples, and also happened to be the same men who were in this boat. Then as Jesus is on the mountain praying, and his disciples are crossing the lake. I wonder if Jesus might have thought, I think they're ready for this. I think they're ready for this. I don't know if they got it at the feeding of the 5,000. I don't know if they understood that. But I, want, I, I wonder if they're ready for this. 
And most, if not all of the disciples, would have been familiar with a passage in the book of the Old Testament called Job. It says these words, Job chapter 9, verses 8 and 11. This is Job speaking, and he says these words. He alone has spread out the heavens and marches on the waves of the sea. Speaking about God. He alone spreads out the heavens and marches on the waves of the sea. Verse 11. Yet when he comes near, I cannot see him. When he moves by or passes me, I do not see him go. The word of God walking on the water. A passage the disciples would have heard. Jesus thinks, must have thought, surely these guys are going to get this. Surely they're going to make this connection. Job is talking about God alone. And Jesus is doing exactly what Job writes in person. But they missed it. (laughs) They missed it. The same God that passed by Moses in the cleft of the rock. And the same God that passed by his disciples that night on the lake still passes by today. He desires to reveal to you that he is not a prophet, a rabbi, a good teacher, another religion, a vending machine, or any other box that you could try to fit him in. He is I am. I don't know where you are today, but I know that there's a God in heaven who is not out of touch. He knows you down to the number of hairs on your head. He loves you enough to give his very best for a chance at a relationship with you. And he wants to reveal who he is to you. And lucky for you and I, he's relentless. He will never give up on you. He will continue to come after you, continue to walk past you, no matter how many times you may miss it. And the disciples missed it a lot. Jesus wants to reveal who he is to you. And maybe you've noticed, if you're familiar with this story, there's a part of it that's been left out or that we haven't read yet. And so to hear this part, we'll need to jump into our final account in the Gospel of Matthew. Which is funny because I don't think these two guys, I don't think that the writer of this and the, and the guy that he's telling the story of got along very well. But at, we're at a part in the story where, where the disciples have seen Jesus. They thought Jesus was a ghost. And Jesus told them not to be afraid. Take courage. I am here. And Matthew writes these words in chapter 14, starting in verse 28. Matthew chapter 14, starting in verse 28. Then Peter, that's the other guy. These guys didn't get along. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you, walking on the water. And I'm so thankful that Jesus is so much better than we expect him to be. Because I would have expected Jesus to say, Peter, you're dumb. Stop it. Stop being stupid. This is not a part where you're supposed to get out of the boat. I'm revealing myself to you, so shut up, sit down, and get back in the boat. But that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, verse 29, yes, come. (laughs) Just blows my mind. I already told you who I am. I already told you who it is. But if you want to get out of that boat and walk to me, then knock yourself out. Come, Jesus replied. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. It's crazy. As if this story wasn't crazy enough. We got a loudmouth disciple heading off to the edge of the boat, and he's walking towards Jesus, and he's actually walking on water. Verse 30. But when he, Peter, saw the strong, some manuscripts don't include that word, wind in the waves, 
He terrified and began, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Now, Matthew's gospel is the only account that records Peter walking on the water. And what's maybe more interesting is the fact that Peter left it out in his account that was edited and recorded by John Mark, and we know it as the Gospel of Mark. You won't find that account in Peter's own story or of telling of this story. And so I'd like to ask everyone a question. Have you walked on water? Do you know anyone who's ever walked on water like you? You actually met them. I haven't. But I can say this. If I did, and I got to tell that story, I'm leaving it in. Because people don't walk on water. God does. But Peter doesn't tell that part of the story. He does, however, make sure to include the fact that he denied his Lord and Savior three times before he was killed. He does keep that part in. But Peter doesn't say anything about walking on water. And this leads us to the final point. Is that Jesus' story is what it's all about. At the time, John Mark probably recorded Peter's story. Peter had been sharing these same stories approximately for 30 years after Jesus had ascended back to heaven. After 30 years, I think Peter had come to realize that the only thing powerful about his story was the fact that Jesus had entered, entered it. That Jesus was the only reason that Peter even had a story to tell, a story worth listening to. At one time, Peter had probably even been one of the disciples arguing about who was going to be the greatest. And James and John, you idiots, why do you think you're going to get to be the greatest? That same disciple... We find out later at Peter's execution that he requested to be crucified upside down because he didn't consider himself worthy to die in the same manner as his Lord. It's because Jesus' story is what it's all about. I think Peter would say, it's not about me. It's about him. I don't heal the sick. Jesus does. I don't free the oppressed and possessed. Jesus does. I don't create or multiply bread. Jesus does. I don't walk on water. I actually sunk. But Jesus does. It's not about my story. It's about Jesus's. So where do we go from here? We talked about a couple of things. But how do we let go of our preconceived ideas of who Jesus is supposed to be or who we think he is or should be? And how do we get to the place where we have the eyes to see him for who he is so that we can be a part of his story. And I think I think I'd like to end on an opportunity for us to respond a couple of different ways and however you feel God leading. If you're here or you're listening in, and you've heard about Jesus, you know a little bit, but you have never made a decision to follow him, to give your life to him. Today can be that day. And you need to understand that Jesus is better than what you're expecting. Regardless of what 
whether you don't have a relationship with him yet or you've been serving him for the last 50 years, Jesus is better than what you're expecting. But also, that Jesus wants to reveal himself to you. And if you're outside of a relationship with him, there's an element you're just never going to unlock in who Jesus is until you give him the keys of your life. Let him get in the driver's seat. Let him take lead. Let him be Lord or King of your life to follow him. So if you're watching and listening today, and that's you, I would encourage you, that's the next step. That's the next step. If you're here today and, and you have given Jesus your life, then what I would like to do is, is offer you an opportunity to, to do a couple of things. One, an opportunity to, uh, to come into God's presence and, and, and just in a, with a spirit of humility asking God to open the eyes of our hearts so that we can see him as he reveals himself to us. Because the, the Christian journey following Jesus is this never-ending revelation of who Jesus is. That on this side of eternity, we, we just, we're doing our very best, but we're just scratching the surface. And Lord willing, and hopefully tomorrow, we'll have a better revelation of who Jesus is than we do today. But it's this never-ending process of our eyes being open to how awesome our God really is, how powerful He is, how loving and gracious and merciful He is. But maybe this is a moment here is for us to be able to just say, I know that I need the peripheral of my eyes, the, the eyes of my heart to be open so that I can see Jesus clearly and for maybe some today the next opportunity is in just a moment of transparency recently I've been <laughs> I've been challenged catching catching what the words that are coming out of my mouth as I'm praying or as I'm journaling or as I'm having conversation with the Lord, I'm, I'll, I'll take a, like a, this snapshot and, and immediately my eyes are open to like somewhere along the way, I, I'd say I don't believe this, but, but I find that the words coming out of my mouth are a reflection that somewhere along the way, I feel like God exists for me. my story or my happiness or convenience or my calling and if you're a Christ follower in the room I, I don't want to burst your bubble but I also want to, I want to shoot straight with you God doesn't exist for us it's the other way around The same with Peter's story. The only thing that's significant about my story or your story is the fact that Jesus has entered it. Not the other way around. And as, and as we listen to the way that these same men whose minds must have been blown even when they didn't fully understand what Jesus was doing in the story that we just read. We, we can see that they get glimpses and they obviously connect the dots after his resurrection. But Jesus as the resurrected Jesus has to even like keep hitting the nail on the head even for them after he's already been resurrected. They're still not fully connecting the dots. And you know what? We don't either. We still don't connect those dots. But you see these men who 
These men who, the Gospels are very clear, they just didn't get it. Jesus continued to reveal himself. He continued to say what he was going to do, and then he did it. And they still didn't get it. And they see the only human in history ever walk on water, and they still don't get it. They see this Lunchable turn into a meal that feeds ten to 20,000 people, and they still don't get it because their hearts were hardened. And so do we. But Jesus keeps pursuing, and he keeps revealing, and he keeps working on us. And we see that as the New Testament is written, we get to see what these men who are just clueless in the boat turn out to be, what, they, what God calls them and what he saw in them all along, this potential in them. But they came to a place where each of these men laid down their lives for him. One day they were arguing about who's going to get to sit at the right and the left of Jesus. And by the end of the journey here on earth for each of those men, they're like, take my life. I can't. I can't say it didn't happen. I can't say that my life hasn't been changed ever since. I can't explain it fully, but I know this. I know this to be true. This is who I follow. This is why I'm here. So take my life if you're going to take it. I will not back down from what I've seen, heard, and experienced. The same one who walked on water denies Jesus three times. But Jesus reinstates him. So maybe today's in a moment where, like Peter, to just confess and say, somewhere along the way, I've... I've I, I've been I've been fooled to think that somehow this is about me. But at the end of the day, I, I, I do feel like as we uh, as, as Andy's going to lead us into a, a time of worship, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, as we're singing this song, I'm going to be in near the front. I would love to pray with you. I'd love to introduce you to the same Jesus we've just got done talking about entering into a relationship with him or if it's just a moment where you're like you know what I just need to confess I need to confess and and there's been areas in my heart where I just haven't submitted to the Lord I've thought hey you know what this is a, a time for me to say God I've missed you I can see would you open my eyes would you forgive me or maybe it's just a moment where you're just sitting there and saying God this week As my life continues from here forward, give me eyes to see you when you reveal yourself to me, when you speak to me, that I'd obey. And so can we do that for the next few moments? However you feel you'd like to respond, whether it's just there in your chair, if you want to turn around and make it a moment of prayer, if you'd like to come up here, I'd love to pray with you. But I've been asking that God would reveal himself to us today and from here forward in a new, in a special, in a fresh way as we seek Him. want to encourage you to either stand if you'd like to or kneel or just whatever you want to do in this moment.
And I'm sorry oh, When I've just gone through the motions I'm sorry When I just sang another song Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you And I'm sorry When I've come with my agenda I'm sorry When I forgot that you're enough Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you. I'm sorry when I've just gone, when I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sing another song. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I just want you. And I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. And I just want you, Jesus. Nothing else. in and said, you know what, you guys have done a pretty good job for yourselves. Um, go reach the city. I'm not going with you. Go take the land that I've given you. <laughs> we would say,
sense this conversation that that the passage we talked about flowed from. God revealed himself to a man who had decided at the end of the day, the only thing I care about is I want to see you. I want to know you're with me. I don't care what else happens from here on out. If you're with me, it's going to be okay. But I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to take another step. I'm not going to inhale another time. Certainly not walking into a land without you. I've got to have you with me. I'm nothing without you. And with you, I have everything. Heavenly Father, as we lean into the calling that you have on our lives, the calling that you've placed on this church for this community, for the plan that's already been written and scripted out by you, give us resolve to not take another step without your presence. That you would continue to reveal yourself and as you continue to reveal yourself because that's a part of your nature, it's just part of who you are pull us in, that we would resolve, I'm not taking another step without you with me. And you go, that's what I'm talking about. And that you would reveal yourself to us in that moment of hunger, in a way that is fresh, in a way that we have never experienced you before. And that that moment wouldn't be just for these warm fuzzies, but it would be so as our grasp of who you are widens that we step into and begin to live out and be who you've called us to be confident in the God we serve have a good rest of your week. Excited. Excited for Chelsea. Excited for every single one of you stepping into your calling this week. We'll see you next week.